enjoying the lake, recreation people, and also for the fish and many other things that live there. Uh, every fall, we have a, a terrible disaster with the mussels. Uh, water goes out so far, there's just so many mussels just die drying up. But uh, uh, we're, we're there and we're here to try to help inform people. And if you see us on Facebook, quite often you'll see um, the lake level and uh, that we post there and also uh, how much water is going through the Ellsworth Dam and uh, sometimes a really nice sunset. So I'll send it back to Brett. <laughs> Thanks, Eddie. And there's some other um, folks from the Graham Lake kind of core team here, Mark Whiting and, and Catherine and Brad and Diane, who when we get to the sort of question session, we'll all be here kind of available to, to um, field, field questions and have a little dialogue. So just to bring us to where we are, I know most people know where Graham Lake is, but this is a map of our part of the world where we live. Um, what you're looking at laid out is sort of the St. Croix River in blue, and then the homeland of the Passamaquoddy, um, traditional homeland laid over in the Union and Graham Lake are over here. So there's Graham Lake, um, kind of orienting us all a little bit. And Graham Lake, I know for a lot of people, um, you know, this is kind of the image that I think of with Graham Lake, you know, fish and cranberries and there's water. It's a, it's a good place that a lot of people connect with. Um, and as I think a lot of people in this phone call know or are tied to, um, it has great, great summer days and, and great, um, great times, as well as some of the, the issues that Eddie was bringing up. Here it is again, Graham Lake. Um, where we are in this sort of process. So this is gonna be a very high level look, not as high as this uh, view of the upper part of Graham Lake during a big drawdown a couple of years ago. But I'm gonna take us quickly through a lot of regulatory detail without a lot of detail. So please be, um, you'll be ready for questions and for clarification, but I'll, I'll try my best. There's two dams in the Union River, one makes Graham Lake, um, they both are part of an active hydroelectric project. They're, um, you know, this, this river makes power. Um, hydro projects need to be relicensed. Um, the owners of dams have to go to the federal government every, you know, 30 to 40 years and say, can we still operate on this public resource? You know, the Union River is a public resource. Um, this process started at the year, you know, 2013. So we're, you know, eight or so years into uh, this relicensing. And during this, there's been events like this where Graham Lake has been extremely drawn down. And I think as people learned, they found this is, you know, it's not always the case, but it's legally allowed. So this is part of the old license. This is a legal drawdown under the old license. Um, and the way these things are relicensed, this is federal um, commission called FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And FERC is the one who at the end of the day writes the, you know, the the license out and says, here's what you have to do if you want to keep doing this. Um, they look at consultation from across state and federal resource agencies, from local governments, from citizens. Um, they also have to look at different laws. And there's three big laws that FERC has to kind of check through in order to issue a license. One of them is the Federal Power Act. It has requirements that can be applied from other agencies around fish and wildlife, as well as um, you know, other resource protection. Then there's the Endangered Species Act, which comes into play on this river because we um, are fortunate enough in Maine to still have Atlantic salmon, which are endangered in the United States. The Union River is a home for those endangered species. Um, and then there's the Clean Water Act, uh, another piece of this relicensing. Where we are now that we're eight years into this process, we've been through most of these laws. And a year ago, we got to the end of the Clean Water Act section. Um, so I should go with this one. The end of the Clean Water Act section. Yeah. So the Clean Water Act component of this is the state of Maine under its Department of Environmental Protection gets to certify or not um, the project's operation. So FERC creates all these, these, these things. And um, during that FERC process is where you know, we first met Eddie Dam. This was at public meeting in Otis. So there was stakeholder input sent in by citizens. FERC makes all these recommendations and then they basically wait for the last piece of the puzzle or the last piece of approval, which is that state 
um, water quality certification. That looks at some of the same things that the whole FERC process has looked at, protecting fish and wildlife and water quality, um, but it has you know, some special charges that under the Clean Water Act, there are requirements that rivers have to attain certain uses. And the state looks at all the information that they're given, primarily information that comes from the applicant, um, and they make a decision and they say this project can be certified or not. Um, a little more than a year ago, March 19th, 2020, the state of Maine said they deny, they say the department denies the water quality certification of the applicant. So this project currently has a, was denied um, its ability to operate um, under this component of the Clean Water Act. FERC then, because it has to consider all these things, can't issue a license with a denial. They, you, know, you need to either have an approval or the state can just waive and say, we're not gonna weigh in on this. In this case, the state denied the license. Um, the owners of the dam are these guys. So Brookfield, um, Asset Management is parent company of Brookfield Renewable, who is parent company of Black Bear Hydro. Um, multinational, sort of large finance, um, you know, big, big projects, energy, real estate, sort of everything you think of. Um, they've appealed that denial. So they've said, we don't agree with parts of that denial. Um, we're going to challenge that. Well, what is that denial based in? You know, again, I'm giving a high level, but really there were three things the state said was wrong um, with the proposal from Brookfield that basically would violate Maine water quality law. And what they relate to, or two relate to Graham Lake, um, sort of the levels and two are sort of downstream impacts. So this is Graham Lake uh, about a month ago when there was still ice on it. Um, this is when the ice went out and you can see these mud plumes in the lower part of the screen. Where this mud's coming from, is from the fact that this lake has an 11 foot drawdown like we saw in that earlier photo. And there's a little toral zone or a, you know, a sort of underwater zone along the edge of the lake that doesn't really stabilize. So it, plants don't grow in it, um, too much of it gets drained. So one piece of this denial was that in Graham Lake, the state of Maine said, you're not meeting water quality standards because you drain the lake too much. You, you go over, you're using 11 feet, they proposed a number that was closer to, to, to seven feet is like six, six something, I mean, uh, closer to six feet, about 5.7 feet. And the state said, that number doesn't get us to within our water quality standard. And you're not showing us how a new level that you're proposing is gonna get us to meet standards. So that was one thing. This mud um, that you saw, it goes downstream. So this is Ellsworth last weekend or two weekends ago, this is, the Leonard Lake Dam, but downstream of Graham Lake. Um, you can see Graham Lake way up there in the distance below that little mountain in the right-hand corner. Um, this river is very muddy. This is not what it should look like. This is not what rivers in Maine look like. We don't live in um, you know, Mississippi where we have millions of cubic acres of land and farmland eroding into the water. This is you know, a problem. Point two of this water quality cert denial was that downstream of Graham Lake, um, the, there aren't enough bugs, there aren't enough macroinvertebrates that there should be in the river below Graham Lake. They didn't say directly it was tied to this because we don't have standards around this kind of mud in, in Maine rivers, this turbidity. But basically the river below Graham Lake because of how Graham Lake was managed doesn't meet standard. There aren't enough of the right um, animals, insects, which are a proxy for the river health um, in the river. So problem. The third problem the state found to deny this license was that in this piece of water we're looking at right here, which is the Union River, um, just above tide, head of tide hits this dam at Leonard Lake. So that's where the tide water stops. In this piece of the river, there's also problems with the amount of dissolved oxygen. So the amount of, of you know, oxygen that fish and other, in, and other aquatic life have to breathe. So they said, you got these three big problems and you're not telling us how you're gonna fix these in your new license. So the state of Maine said, we can't certify this project. End of story. Again, Brookfield's appealing that decision. That decision, that appeal is before the Board of Environmental Protection. So the Maine Department of Environmental Protection made the ruling that said, you get, we're denying the license. Brookfield appeals, the process basically then kicks it to the Board of Environmental Protection where they can either uphold the decision, they could agree with Brookfield, you know, they can sort of, you know, they're the next piece of the puzzle. That 
we're being told will happen in the next month or so. Um, the schedule isn't confirmed and when the board's gonna hear that, but it's coming up. Um, there will be a point then where either Zion will stand, so FERC will, again, be unable to issue a license, or there might be a change and that FERC could issue a license or you know, they could resubmit um, a possible application. There's sort of some questions around where the process might go next, but that's where we are. So what does, um, hold on here. Slide that going forward. Um, basically, what does that mean? So about three months ago, um, a letter was written to the local paper in Ellsworth and in the Bangor Daily by Brookfield's regional vice president. And it basically said, hey, if we don't get certified, um, we're gonna decommission this project. So we're gonna turn off the project um, and, and we might take the dams out and walk away. The reality of the way these processes work is it's not that simple. Even if Brookfield doesn't get an active license here, if the BEP stands up and says, we agree with the DEP, the department, um, decommissioning is not something that happens overnight. And it's another stakeholder agency sort of driven process um, that we're, you know, DSF, Friends of Graham Lake, you on, the, on this call get to be a part of and get to sort of work out solutions. So again, Brookfield could get denied, like the denial could confirmed, they could then offer to work with the DEP perhaps to figure out a different solution. They could go back to FERC, try again, or this decommissioning could start, which could then start a process of figuring out, well, what do we want with our river regionally? And what DSF has come to believe always is, you know, Graham Lake matters a lot to this region and there's ways to restore fish and also have Graham Lake. So I don't know, I'm trying to get to kick off to Dwayne here, but my screen is frozen, I think. I don't know if there's a way where, Aaron, you could kill my screen or something, but. Um. Yeah, let me, I can stop your sharing. But, but, I would, but that's, again, really fast, really high level, um, there we go. Walk through where we are. Now I wanna throw it over to Dwayne to talk a little bit about why we're here and interested and also sort of where you know, some ideas about where things might go. Um, and then, like I said, we'll be able to talk a little more about details, but that's a quick run through. So Dwayne. Okay. Probably... Yep. Thank you, Brett. Um, and Aaron and Ed for doing such a great job of introducing this and in back to the Downey Salmon Federation, who we are, we're a locally based um, conservation organization focused on sea run fish including Atlantic salmon, which as Brett had mentioned are now an endangered species. We got organized at a period of time when salmon were still um, fished for in the rivers down east, including the Union River back in the 80s. Um, this this uh, set of dams went through relicensing back in those days. And um, at that time, Bangor Hydro prevailed. It, it ended up in court, they managed to um, get a new license without addressing these issues. At that point in time, salmon were not endangered in, in the issues over fish passage were set aside essentially in the, in the small truck and tra trap operation. So there is a trap below the lower dam that allows alewives to be caught and brought up and over into Grand Lake and, and into Leonard Lake and for salmon to be trapped and then put in a trailer and trucked around um, above Graham Lake. Well, that situation is, is clearly not ideal. There are still Atlantic salmon coming back to this river. There's, there's still some stocking going on. And um, through all these years, since the 80s, DSF has kept our eye on this, along with our um, partner organization called the Union Salmon Association which has been also in um, active since the 80s. So as we look at the situation, we've, we've realized there is hope here. There's hope that this watershed could be recovered for Atlantic salmon and other fish. And um, it, there's a commercial fishery for river herring or alewives there now that the city has um, 
uh, certain responsibility and control over, and it's a it's a profitable source of income. Um, there's a lot of elver fishing that happens in this watershed um, below the dam. Now the video I was going to show, and I don't know if it's going to be able to be shown or not. This one here, Dwayne. You're not, not sharing. You're not sharing anymore, Brett. <laughs> I might see. This is why we're. So this is a video of a of a river that was essentially called dead not that long ago in the in the 60s and 70s in England. And if this video works, you'll see what now is a very lively river. This is a, a city, the city of Newcastle, England, mm -hmm. near the Scottish border. And recovery of Atlantic salmon has been achieved here just phenomenally. There are thousands of salmon returning to this river where there were very, very few. Um, like I said, back in the 60s, 70s, there's a dam on this river. It's managed much differently than what we see at Graham. There's a hatchery on this river that's managed very differently than the hatcheries in, in um, Maine currently. And, and we're modeling our program af after this. So our hatchery is modeled after the one. This is the Tyne River in North England, right near the Scottish border. So that was sent to us by um, a friend there. So that's not an unusual situation. That was just shot with his iPhone. Um, so to think that you know the game is over for Atlantic salmon is something that we're always pushing back on. The fact that you know this river is always going to be this way is something we're pushing back on. In in the river itself, just um, by way of um, scale, is roughly the same size as the Machias River, downtown Machias, the falls that you're all familiar with. But what this slide is showing is that it's the square miles river drainage, 500 plus miles of, of drainage area. Passage status is three. It has a dam, if you look at the bottom, dam at or near the head of tide, trap and truck only. That's a very low, low standard. As you can see, looking at all these other rivers, they're all up at one or two. So not even the Androscoggin is, is at this current state. So it's, it's an unusual circumstance and in, in the fact that you know, as much as 11 feet of water are drawn out of Graham um, at any one time is, is really unusual. So it's all of these things combined have, have brought us into this and we've been deeply involved for the last eight years, as many of you know. So we've been um, talking with the agencies, talking with stakeholders, the, the town cities, and with Brookfield as well about is there a solution going forward. And there are a number of directions that, that this may go. The next step, of course, as Brett said, is, is what the main board of environmental protection will do in the hearing that we expect to have in May. And from that point forward, there may be the potential to, to work with, with Brookfield to address these things. However, they really, really want to have that water to be able to draw down on. That's where the profitability is for them. And that exacerbates the, the muddiness, the oxygen issues and so on, in part because vegetation can't be established there. It, that's a large part of it. Um, so that's that's really just um, a little bit of context about why DSF is involved and why we believe there's there's loads of potential here for recovery, not just of salmon, not just river herring, alewives, um, shad, sea run brook trout, and a number of other fish. So that's that's all that I had to contribute. Thanks, Dwayne. And, and sorry that I was my my computer desktop like froze for a while there. So we, we were a little I guess I, <laughs> I would add one one more thing that that Graham Lake itself is designated as critical habitat for endangered Atlantic salmon. So under the Endangered Species Act, that is a travel corridor for these fish, the fish that are um, moving toward the sea and those that are moving up into the freshwater travel through the lake 
and potentially adult Atlantic salmon could overwinter in the lake. So after they spawn, they don't all die like the documentaries you see of Pacific salmon. Atlantic salmon could potentially, uh, they do live through their spawning and then they can go back out to sea and come back to spawn again. So this, this watershed is, is very fortunate in, in terms of main river systems in that the Green Lake National Salmon Hatchery is in the watershed, drains directly into Graham Lake. So the potential to recover salmon in this, in this system is, is pretty, pretty high if we can address the water quality issues and the, the fish passage issues. This is this that that slide there was just to show that what spawning gravel looks like, what the river looks like above Graham Lake, and up into Branch Lake Stream and and other places throughout the the watershed. And there were tremendous fisheries here at one time, and we've gone back and documented all of that. However, there were impassable dams built early on, and it was quite controversial controversial throughout. A couple of hundred years. Yeah, and so now, I mean, like I said, we ran through a lot um, at a high level. So this is a chance just to sort of, I think, to bounce ideas around, hear questions for us. Um, so anyone, I think Aaron's going to sort of facilitate calling on folks. So here's. How about it? I see uh, Butch has his hand up. Yeah, I got a question about the long-term goals of the Downey Salmon Federation. Is that to restore fish passage and keep the lake, remove the dam? What What is your long-term thing, Dwayne? Yeah. Hi, Butch. Thanks for asking. Um, it's it's somewhat up in the air at this point, but the Graham we've made it clear that we're not interested in seeing the Graham Lake Dam removed. Stabilization of Graham Lake at um, a more normal lake level, like other natural lakes in the state, is both the goal of the main BEP, DEP, and DSF at this at this point. We do want to see state of the art fish passage. There's no excuse whatsoever that state-of-the-art fish passage is, isn't already in place and shouldn't be made to be put in place immediately as part of this license. So what that looks like is um, it turns into a very major investment by, by Brookfield. So if you could picture a 70-foot fish elevator down in at Leonard Lake, um, and what that would cost to put in place to allow all of the native fish to move up and back volitionally, so quote unquote, the word that's used is when the fish arrive, they need to be able to move through there. They can't be delayed. And, and that's what we've seen on the Penobscot is that Brookfield is, has, has fishways that are state of the art and, and working quite well. So they, they have the, the know-how, the capability but they're not willing in this case to make that investment. So if that means that Leonard Lake is in the generation at Leonard, perhaps is no longer viable for, for them, which is what they've said publicly, then that opens the question of whether Leonard Lake and that dam can remain or not. Someone has to pay for the long-term maintenance of that structure. And, and Butch, to Dwayne's point too about levels at, at Graham, I'll sh we'll share with that. We have everyone's email from registering. We'll share the denial that the DEP issued because they outline what, what would meet standard. And for us, meeting water quality standard is what we want to see. And um, at, at Graham Lake, the, the state has said that, that to meet water quality standard, 11 feet or 10.8 feet is what they've done for years. Um, they proposed about a 5.7 foot drawdown. The DEP has said, you know, based on their evidence, it might be more like a two and a half to three foot drawdown that's actually meets standard. So um, if we're, you know, asking for this lake to adhere to standards, it's probably more where the drawdown range would end up. 
And that that would allow vegetation to establish in that in the very shallow um, conditions of that that water body, which would then help to stabilize the of course the the bottom. It wouldn't be as muddy. You have better clarity and so on. So if a fishway could be built at Graham Lake, of, of, as has been done up in Howland, it would be one example of that where the dam was uh, remained and they built a bypass channel around the, the dam. So the lake level is maintained, bypass channel installed and you have free flow of, of water through that and the fish can move through there as well. Okay, so we're looking at a two to three foot drawdown is optimal, and they're proposing a 5.7. Any guesses as to where the end product will be if they keep it? And if they don't, what happens to the dam, uh, all the waterfront properties and things of that nature? And what, what happens to the petroglyphs? We have petroglyphs that you know, the muddiness, it's affecting these petroglyphs as the water comes up and hits them. Right. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that, but the petroglyph piece of it, but if um, if the lake, it, someone has to pay to maintain the dam, and that's what it comes down to, and this is a situation that's playing out all over the world all the time, is these the dams do cost money to maintain. There's There are some examples in Maine where historic um, mill dams, those that were set up for, um, you know, big industrial mill dams with large lakes where the mills had gone out of business and the towns get together. I believe there's an example of one in Maine. I can't pull up the name of the, of the lake at the moment, but where four towns actually got together and contribute to the maintenance of that dam. So it was an industrial site, uh, the industry moved on, the dam remained and the towns worked together to, to um, address the maintenance of the dam. And, and one place, sorry. Uh, and to establish a lake level that of course would, would be agreeable to, to the people around the lake. And Butch, to that process question, so I mentioned a word during the presentation that I, I the slide of this this uh, letter from the Brookfield VP, I didn't show up, but decommissioning is what would, so again, so say that T, the DEP level of two and a half or three feet is not amicable to the operation for the owner, and they say, well, we're going to not produce power, they start the decommissioning process. FERC will not release a dam until they figure out the questions, like they figure out who, if there's going to be a Graham Lake, they'll figure out who's going to help pay for it. And co and you, you know, basically, we, the collective, we in the region, you know, build a coalition to be able to deal with it financially, to think about alternative solutions that will let FERC release it. FERC doesn't just say, okay, Brookfield, you don't want to run the dam anymore, yank it tomorrow. It's not the way it works. There's this whole process that opens up that allows for, you know, the next sort of generation solution to the problem. Um, so that's, you know, that's the, the trigger that would start if, if they, you know, didn't want to go to that level. Um, About how like, long does that process like we, take? Yeah. And any guess as to how much it would cost the towns to maintain that dam in order to keep their tax base up because all those waterfront properties they'd end up losing. Right. Those, those are all the components of what would be the long list of questions that would have to be addressed and um, fish passage installation, long-term maintenance of, of the structure um, in how that relates to, like you said, um, the valuation of properties around the lake. And then of course, Leonard Lake, which is much smaller. Graham Lake is somewhere around 8,000 plus acres. Leonard Lake is down around 100 acres different situation altogether so there's you know there are a lot of things that would have to be evaluated here as as they would be and and brookfield is evaluating all of these requirements that will be placed upon a license should they ultimately get one to determine is this economically viable or not right 
in the same thing, the city would have to do the same thing in the towns. Right. Wayne, we've got a couple other questions here. So there, Angela has their hand up. Let me give Hi. them a second. Yes. Um, I, I just, oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, question is, um, can, what, what, can the um, hydro company exist and do what they need to do at the two to three left, uh, foot drop? In, instead of the bigger drops. So, um, yeah, go, go ahead, bro. Sure. Was, so, you know, those decisions are made, the way that the, the licensing process works, you know, the license conditions are applied and the power company has to make that call, right? So they have to crunch their own numbers. But if you remember that one slide, you know, Brookfield is a 300, they own over $330 billion in assets worldwide. Um, so that's a, it's a, you know, a calculus they would have to make. Got it. And and does the power they generate just go to the grid? Like if they don't generate that power anymore, does it hurt people? So th this place has some value because it's um, your dams in general have some value because you can just store water and then release it when you want. So this is grid power um, that you use as peak energy. Um, it's not a huge producer and it's like sort of, it could produce boilerplate, which is like, how much can it make if it, everything is equal is about 8.9 megawatts, which um, isn't that big. I can't remember exactly the percentage of the state power, but it's a very small amount. Um, and the conditions that are already being applied to this project um, by FERC. So someone also asked about what level might end up at. If the state wasn't a part of this process, FERC, the feds have already said four and a half feet is about as much as they're gonna allow Brookfield to draw down. And Brookfield actually said publicly they're going to do a four and a half foot drawdown this summer. This year, they've already used about six and a half feet of their drawdown. But um, so they've already lost a lot of generation ability, even in the sort of the best case from the feds. Um, so, you know, the amount of energy you can produce in the next 30 years is kind of a quite, it's kind of an unknown. Um, it'll be based on how they can operate this place on the final conditions. And, and just one more question. The, the lake is a lake because of the dam. This is a man-made totally. yep. uh, reservoir, yep. right? So, you know, getting rid of the dam, when you talk about decommissioning it, I mean, there would be no lake without a, the dam. You, yep, there's a, there's a um, as of 1922 was the year that dam was built. So before that, there was no, um, there was no lake there. Okay, thank you. So we've got an ecological question in the chat, which I'll read and then I'll uh, then I'll go to William Barna. So the question is, do you think if lake levels are regulated that Graham will become a weedy lake? Well, the Mark Whiting uh, question, maybe Dwayne. Right, if Mark is, if Mark's on and wants to uh, speak to that, Mark was, is a retired DEP scientist, lives in the watershed, and has studied lake vegetation in a variety of places. Yeah. So yes, um, Graham Lake uh, would be a shallow, big shallow lake, and it would have a very um, productive um, literal zone and it would be weedy and it'd be full of fish and full of life and um, you are allowed as a property owner to um, clear out an area to bring in your boat and to do some swimming but um, you're not allowed to take out all the plants because the plants are really important wildlife habitat so without so if you if you think about a lake you know, without, without the water in it, it's basically a bowl. And um, <clears throat> uh, there's, no, there's no features in it. There's no place for animals to hide. And so you have to have rocks, you have to have stumps, you have to have plants. Um, you have to have that structure there for the animals to live there. So it's like a forest, you know, if the forest was gone, all the animals would be gone. And so, so those plants that live there are a really important part of the natural community. So some people object to the weediness of shallow lakes, but that's what shallow lakes are. And um, um, if the plants aren't there, then the 
the wildlife isn't there either, basically. And um, also if the plants aren't there, then there's nothing to dampen the wave action and there's nothing to consolidate the sediments and it's muddy. <laughs> and so that isn't great for swimming either. So EPA's standard for swimmable water is basically zero turbidity <laughs> because um, you can't see where you're going. Or if a child gets in there and gets in over their head, you can't rescue them if you can't find them. And so, um, you know, it's, so all of these, all of these issues are interrelated. Um, as an ecologist would say, well, it's all, all connected. <laughs> And um, so the, you know, the shallowness, the weediness, the plants and animals are all, you know, part of the system. Thanks, Mark. William, go, go ahead. Yes, how you doing? Thank you, everyone. Um, what, first of all, I'd like to thank Mark for his uh, input. That was a great input. On what's going on with Graham Lake? I've got a couple of questions. One is, I wanna have an assurance from Downey Salmon before I support them, that Graham Lake Dam is not on the agenda to be torn down by them, that they're not gonna back up that in now or in the future. Because as a, as a property owner on the lake, going on now 10 years, was one of the big reasons why I ever purchased my property was because I love Graham Lake. I'm a uh, avid fisherman, avid outdoorsman, and that would completely destroy, there would be no lake. If, if the dam's gone, there's no lake. And as a fisherman, it's not just about the salmon, but it's also about all the other creatures that live in the lake, whether it be smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, which was, I guess, introduced a few years back. Um, and everything else, the clams, the freshwater clams, the ducks, I mean, I could go on and on and forever. I just wanna make sure that we're not just, you know, centering on the salmon, but on all every all the environmental factors that go into Graham Lake and that yeah. this lake and, is not gonna be taken down. Yeah, and this is this question comes up a lot in our work, not at just the Union River in many, many places. And, and as you saw in the, in both our mission statement and the photos that we've shown of uh, white perch and cranberries and, and salmon, um, our position has been from the beginning, we want to see state-of-the-art fish passage. We would love to see a win-win here with Brookfield able to generate power, um, deal with the water quality issues, the lake sedimentation and all these things. Where this is all going to land, we don't know yet because Brookfield owns these structures. It's there, theirs to maintain and, and they have a responsibility to deal with the restrictions placed upon them in a new license. Our, our position recently, we've come out and said, Graham Lake needs to stay in this scenario because it is so ecologically important and socially important for the reasons you just spelled out. And that is the position that we've taken. We've put that in writing a number of times and we're willing to stand behind that. Dwayne, and I, and I will Dwayne, say- as long, just, as long as you're yeah. supporting that, yes. I'm with you 110%, all right? But if I get wind of anything saying that the Graham Lake Dam is coming down, yeah. I will not support you folks. Well, right? it may be out of our control. Of I mean, it's, not just, it's not just a matter of my cottage, yes. my camp, right? It's everybody that's on Graham Lake. And it's also as an avid, like I said, again, as an avid outdoorsman, it's not just about the salmon. It's about all the fish, right. all the all the animals, the creatures that have established themselves for over the past hundred years. Yes. And I will not support anybody that is has even the inkling of tearing that dam down. Well, I think that what we have to look at is how do we find the solution to, to keep what's there there and to make it better. 
and well, and that's what I hear you saying, and and I and I believe that that's possible. We've seen it. I gave the example of another town where where they had done that. It ultimately should Brookfield choose to exit. Um, the responsibility has to go somewhere, and that costs absolutely. Us and I and I agree with you, but I think there's we have options, like you said stated before, and I agree with you 100. percent we have the options of towns getting together, right? Whether it be Mariahville, Otis, Ellsworth. All of the above. Well, I am. All right, all of the above. Right. And there's other options also to supporting that dam. Right. And, so, and, and William, just one point to make on that too is, <clears throat> this is where staying engaged with this process is really important, right? So right. You know, watching the BEP, watching the, D, you know, if it moves in this direction towards decommissioning, being there, because the way this process is set up is it, it needs input. It's only as good as what comes into it. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Listen, I was in the meeting, I believe it was uh, two years ago in Ellsworth at the high school. And I stood up and I talked in front of everybody. All right? I'm a 20 year army veteran. One of the reasons why I bought, I, I love Maine. I, I live currently live in the state of Connecticut. I'm gonna be shortly retiring up to Maine, to my beautiful place on Graham Lake. And that's where I spend on living the rest of my life. So it's a big investment for me to make sure that we do this right, <clears throat> one way or another. That's great. And, and, and the towns have a load of authority in this process. They, people, you know, the agencies listen to the towns and cities. And if the towns can come forward with a solution, um, we have spoken with Brookfield. They've said, essentially, if you can bring us ideas, we're willing to we're willing to listen. They're not guaranteeing um, cooperation, but they're willing to listen. And and if they hear loud and clear from the towns, and I don't know which town you're located in, but uh, the town and the city of of Ellsworth singing uh, off the same sheet, it, it'll make a big impact. Well, I'm in I'm in Mariahville. I'm on mm -hmm. the northern northern more of the uh, northern side of the lake. All right, mm -hmm. and like I stated, there I think we have options, and I have no problem work working with Black Bear or w whatever you want to call them. All right, mm -hmm. and I think there's options that we're there. Listen, they got to make money and we got to be happy. And I think there's a solution to that. Right. But it's also important to note that, that there are those three laws that we talked about, right? Federal Power Act, Near and Species Act, Clean Water Act. And everyone's got to follow those. So it's Correct. important. So Absolutely. Those are, yep. Absolutely. And, those are, and those are what are reviewed and again, in decommissioning and all this stuff. So it's just one of these places where it feels frustrating because we're eight years into this conversation. And there's not a big place right now for really anyone to be putting input in because it's being held by the state right now. But there's going to be those opportunities still. And just, you know, the, the big thing here is for everyone to kind of like keep keep the stamina going a little bit longer because we're going to, you know, the, the marathon ha will, you know, we'll get to a place where there's, you know, the refreshments and we can. Oh, and listen, I right, agree right. with you. I think, I, think the, I think the big thing is if we can get a, a fish ladder going up Graham Lake, that's environmentally friendly and economically friendly to both parties, which would be us or Black Bear. And I think that if they stop the huge drawdowns they were doing, because the drawdowns the past few years have really, really disappointed me. I mean, horrible. I've got pictures of me standing in front of stumps that I fish on, on Graham Lake, that are normally 10, 12 feet you know, well, on that portion of the lake, the, the bottom of the stump is 12 feet to the depth, right? And I'm standing there in dry in dry mud, and that's just horrendous. Right. Well, that is oh, going oh. to change. We don't know how far. And and Aaron, I know that there are other questions, so we should probably. Yeah. I'll shoot it over to you. To that sounds good. Facilitate. I see a, a couple of hands up from folks who have I've asked questions before. So I'm going to just go to the chat 
we've got a question before we get to you. I know we've got about seven minutes till eight o'clock, so we can see how long we need we can we can have here. But question: What steps can we take now to prepare for Brooksville Brooksfield backing out? What can we get written feedback of what other places um, have done for options to maintain the dam? Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a really good question and goes along the lines of what we've discussed already is that in, in working with your town or city, um, it would be nice to present some concepts. And we don't know if if there's going to be a need to go in this direction or not, but it, it certainly is nice to plan in advance for the potentiality, right? So um, we will generate some examples and share those with people. And that's part of what we've been doing just in, in the last few months, looking at some of those other examples. So we can put that together and circulate that through the Friends of Graham Lake. Some examples, uh, case studies that point to here's here's a solution that might be similar enough. Each case is often so different, but um, I think that there are a couple of other examples we could point to. Right, and Dwayne mentioned Howland earlier to that question. Um, you know, and that's that was a place where like a hydro dam, a dam that was part of being re potentially being relicensed. You know, people wanted to keep a dam and provide for fish um, and, you know, created this sort of nature-like option. And, you know, that's not something people have thought about at Graham because it hasn't had to been, no one's had to think about it yet. So, you know, um, that's why it's not easy to point to what the solution looks like because, you know, we're the people, you know, at this point in time are the ones who are creating the solution, right? Like, you know, whether it's the owner now or a different owner um, or a bunch of communities, right? And then, it, we, Dwayne didn't mention this, but so the Downey Seven Federation, one of our roles is we direct habitat restoration projects. So that might be a dam removal. Like we took a dam out in Ellsworth a few years ago on Branch Lake Stream. In the same year, we also invested lots of money in fishway designs and built a fishway on a dam in Pembroke because there was a need to keep that dam. But all these questions, once you're presented with the problem, so when, if the problem is how do you keep Graham Lake and put a fishway in, because that's where we approach and how do you manage a level that's good for lake owners. Then we start looking for, you know, the, the resources to design the fishway and, and get there again? if we get there. Right, we, we placed a facilitated and got all the permits and helped raise the funds with the Poca Moonshine Crawford Lake Association. So there's one dam at at the outlet, which establishes the lake level of those two large lakes, Crawford and Poca Moonshine. And we work with the association there to repair the dam, put in a, in a brand new fishway. And we went one step further and, and put in underwater video cameras so we could actually document the fish that were moving up and through. In fact, we just put that back in this week again for the 21 season. So there, are examples of um, right, you know, fairly nearby of, of things that we've done like that. Yeah, good, good question. Got a new hand, Leslie. Hi, thank you guys so much for this presentation. We're new landowners up there and we're like William, very um, interested in the quality of the lake for all the animals and for all the humans that want to be there. So I, my question is, um, although there doesn't seem to be a lot to do right now while we're waiting, um, my question is, what are we, what's the next step and how will we know and what do we need to do when we know? Like where, mm -hmm. can you kind of walk us through next steps that we need to be paying attention to? Well, I think coming to this meeting is, is a great first step and maybe this is your first or maybe it's second or third, but friends, getting involved with Friends of Graham and Friends of Graham will keep you posted on, on occurrences. And, and similarly with Downey Salmon Federation, get plugged into our okay. website and so on so that you're alerted to things as they develop. We will, we will certainly keep track of what's going on at the BEP and the outcome of that in 
and then um, there'll be other steps as well. So I think what you're doing right now, and we've we've put out alerts a number of times over this eight year period. Now's the time to sign a petition. Now's the time to reach out to this agency or that agency. And, and I think having um, a conversation with your neighbors around the lake, the, the town in which you're located is really important because some of the towns have taken formal positions, have sent letters in to help um, selectmen come, you know, the select boards change. So it's good to, you know, make sure that the next leadership is always aware of what's what's cooking so and, and also i think the other thing to do is like we reach out to us so we can provide our i'll provide my email in the chat we can send you the the years of, of stuff on this so you can get a sense of the you know how this has played out and be well better educated around the issue a little bit one one thing just understanding this place is is hard because it's a long spread of history around this river you know people there's a, there's a question actually about the dam being built for flooding. The dam wasn't built for flooding. It was built to make extra water for the lower dam, the, the, the Ellsworth Dam, the one at Leonard Lake, which was built in 1907. When they built that, John Graham, who started Bangor Hydro basically, he knew that they needed more water storage. So he had planned always to dam up Graham Lake, get a bunch more water. Um, and it actually, it blew out right away the first year it filled. And act, literally, it flooded Ellsworth. It was the opposite of helping Ellsworth from flooding. It it destroyed a whole segment of Ellsworth's history in, in a in a few days in May in nineteen in nineteen twenty um, twenty two. So um, you know, just getting us a, a, a good background on these issues. You know, we can help direct you towards the right agencies um, that can help you understand this. But really, it's kind of a waiting game right now with the BEP. Um, Do we have a time frame on this waiting game? Do you have it's, it sounds like it should be soon, like this spring. It's what we're, we're hearing, but you know, it's not it's not something that we have control over, and we haven't got a straight answer in, on this, so we're just kind of waiting it out. I think the state is, um, you know, things were slowed down with COVID, and I think there's just been a slow drive mm -hmm. to get things done right. Okay. Well, also there's a there's a whole new community that's been developed up there uh, that we're a part of now, and I think a lot of those people that are part of that big community that have bought land along the lake and like William, who may want to retire down the road, would have a, a big vested interest in what's going on here. And I don't think that they're a part of this meeting tonight. So anything that we can do to help like sort of uh, get people uh, more involved in this conversation, I think will be best for everybody. Yeah, I agree. There's a lot a lot of information if you look on on the web and on our website and so on about the situation as a whole um so there is information already generated but the new chapters are unfolding here and we're like we said we're not necessarily in control of what direction this is going to go um right so it's a work big work in progress and you know one little fascinating fact about Graham Lake itself and and Brett mentioned that the first year that that dam was built it blew out it wasn't built properly they came back in and built it properly and then it and then they've done maintenance various times since then but when that blew out it was the biggest and remains as I understand the biggest man-made disaster in Maine's history in terms of dollars and cents it washed out the Route 1 bridge. It washed out a lot of buildings and wharves and so on. So there's some interesting history here. Great, thank you, Dwayne. And I, I think great great question to, to wrap things up about what, what are the next steps. And on our end, you know, all of you folks who registered and attended this meeting um, can send out an email right away if there are additional questions and comments that you'd like to make um, contact for both Downey Salmon Federation and Friends of Graham Lake, as well as the kind of where those resources are to learn more about the history and the information. So we can get that information out to you soon. Brett, did you have any other? No, I just threw my email in the chat box for folks yeah. to reach out directly to DSF. So. 
and and it, if there are any questions that we missed here in the chat, um, the chat will be saved as well. So I'll make sure they send that along to our host, Downey Salmon Federation and Friends of Graham Lake, so that we can make sure that those are are addressed as well. But thank you all so much for great turnout and great conversation and, and questions. It's, I know it's a, a challenge with so many unknowns right now, but it's great to, to know where we are right now. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. This, this was a great, great meeting. Yeah. Posting pictures of the sunsets. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Ed, damn. Thanks, Ed. Yeah. yeah. Trying to do Thanks, that every Ed, day. Dwayne. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bye bye. Good evening, hey, Charlie. <laughs> Good night. I know that. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Good night. Go out and have some fun on that lake. Bye bye. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. See you, Brett.